research in black culture. We are just so happy to have you here. And this webinar is going to be about, you know, our competition at Archive Science. We want to say thank you to Dr. Richard and Dr. Jane and then their team who are going to present their work and, you know, kind of go through everything. So I just want to let you know that if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A section mm -hmm. and take time, you know, feel free to introduce yourself to tell us a little bit more about you. So just kind of in the chat, in the chat room. Without further ado, I want to say thank you to um, the Milan Foundation who made possible this uh, a webinar series on emerging technologies, big data, and archives. I also want to say thank you to Claire, the Council on Libraries and Information Resources. I also want to say thank you to uh, the Schomburg, uh, NYU, New York, Public, uh, New York University, and also to the Oklahoma State University, actually who co-hosted this uh, series on emerging technologies, big data, and uh, the archives. Thanks. So now is over to you, Dr. Richard, and your team. So I'm going to share my screen. Just can you hear me well enough? Yes. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, absolutely thrilled to be part of this webinar. Big thanks to um, CLEAR and also um, to organizers of the Erie uh, conference. We're, we're actually um, kind of double streaming um, using this channel and uh, this is one of the virtual uh, archival uh, eerie week sessions as well so um, we should have some really good attendance and there's a there's a really good um, relevant uh, focus theme of archives and technology so um, let me move forward here hold on these are my collaborators today so this is going to be a collaborative a group session and, um, and actually it's a reflection of the nature of this field um, that we're going to uh, introduce and talk about and share with you. All these projects are kind of learning by doing, working in interdisciplinary teams um, with uh, clients, customers, um, and in very diverse teams with, uh, with computer scientists, archivists, librarians, information scientists, um, really interesting and exciting work. Hope to give you a sense of that. Uh, so you'll hear, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of context. This is the agenda on what this uh, thing uh, we call computer, computational archival science is, where it came from, and what the relevance uh, um, is and in the moment. So that's the, the here and the now. I'm going to talk to you about the launch of a collaboratory that is meant to facilitate, disseminate uh, collaborations in this space. But my, beyond the context, my primary focus in hopefully the first 10, 15 minutes is to show you a, a, a just-in-time case study um, that students, um, practitioners and I have been working on for maybe two and a half weeks now since uh, since mid-June and the idea behind this is just to show things in progress so that um, these presentations don't look like well-finished polished uh, products this is really um, this is really uh, in-flight work so that's that's gonna be my focus and uh, the topic is gonna be artificial intelligence and deep learning using FDR World War II Presidential Library Diaries. My colleague, uh, Jane Greenberg, is going to transition and talk about very significant uh, library, data science, archives, um, educational initiatives, in particular her IMLS-funded LEADS program, which might be of interest to some of you online. Um, the core of the presentation is really going to be uh, the fellows. 
both the Leeds Fellows and the AIC Fellows, who are going to spend uh, probably two thirds of the of the presentation, um, working and showing you an in depth case study on the computational treatments to remember the legacy of slavery. Um, also labeled reasserting erased memory, a very timely project that exercises a lot of these techniques. And then we'll all come back and wrap up and hopefully there'll be um, some time for um, a good Q&A and discussion. So let me get started. So what is this thing called computational archival science? Well, this is actually a conversation that started four years ago. And it came on the heels of what does it mean um, to start computing uh, things on the archive side. And we looked in particular at more established, more mature fields. So computational XXX. So computational social science is, is well established. Certainly computational biology is, has been out there for a long time. There are programs, degrees, uh, postdocs in this field. Uh, kind of a, a newcomer is computational journalism. It's uh, just a few years old. Looking at news feeds, uh, it, it intersects a little bit with archival science. So this is the focus of our, of our seminar today. Uh, um, computational archival science, it's a little newer, um, but, um, but it's rapidly gaining momentum. So what is CAS? Well, it's, uh, it's an attempt to explore the computational treatments of archival and cultural content. For those of you who might be interested after this webinar, there's a Google group. Uh, I put up um, a Twitter feed for a, a new collaboratory I'll talk about in a few, uh, in a few minutes. Um, so here's a working definition of CAS. We're calling it a transdisciplinary, so beyond interdisciplinary, uh, transdisciplinary, very collaborative field focused on the application of computational methods in support of archival things, archival um, processes. So in particular, in support of appraisal, arrangement, description, preservation, and access. One of the additional dimensions to this, to this uh, definition is the notion of scale. We're interested in computing things on very large collections where um, sort of human uh, processes and workflows might no longer be adequate. There's a foundational paper that came out two years ago. It was actually written four years ago when we started. It took a little while to come out. If any of you are interested, this is kind of how we, we set this in motion and it gives you examples of interdisciplinary efforts and through eight case studies, looking at computational linguistics, digital humanities, graph analytics, archival representation, things we call computational finding aids, digital curation, et cetera. And um, there's, there's some interesting uh, content there. In particular, there's a focus on um, takeaway lessons and how, what the significance of this could be in an educational setting. Um, again, as part of my preamble, giving you some context, this was four years ago. Um, well, this is how it's uh, manifests itself right now. If, uh, if you want to dig into this a, a, a little more, there's two issues of the Journal of Records Management, it's under Emerald Publishing, that are coming out this summer. And I was, um, I was guest editor with Julie McLeod. Um, and this was looking at uh, the kinds of computational topics we'll, we'll mention uh, uh, again in the next few slides. Explainable AI, natural language processing, automation of appraisal, computational archival science, distributed ledgers, ethics in, uh, in the computational age, et cetera. So, so keep your eye out for that. I also want to mention an ACM journal on computing and cultural heritage. It's a special issue and I'm co-editor with my colleagues, Mark Hedges from King's College and Irene Gudaruli from the UK National Archives. The deadline is at the end of the summer. So if, these, if this presentation inspires you and you're thinking of contributing, submitting uh, paper ideas, please check this out. All right, 
almost there, the here and the now. Um, what, what is the purpose of all of this? And, and what is the sense of urgency? Well, as, as we've been discussing for a long time, there are fundamental changes afoot in the way we acquire, manage, and present cultural collections. This is nothing new, but the pace has accelerated. If you uh, throw in uh, COVID-19, um, we have a major, major challenge uh, with um, suddenly lack of access to archival materials, to libraries, museums. And this, this puts uh, an even greater sense of urgency into digital access and preparing and computing things uh, to provide new modes, new modes of interaction. Uh, just a few, uh, we could fill um, uh, several screens with interesting initiatives and things that are uh, on the horizon, but just a few in, um, representative and important um, points in the here. In the US, uh, many of you uh, have probably followed this. There's an OMB um, and National Archives directive uh, that states that in the next year and a half, only transfers of electronic records with appropriate metadata will be accepted. This is pretty fundamental in terms of policy change and is likely to have a ripple effect on, uh, on the entire uh, landscape, records management landscape. If you, if you just look around uh, in the US, the Smithsonian a few years ago launched a data science lab. They're doing some really interesting things. So this is in the middle of museums, you have artificial intelligence, deep learning, computer scientists, biologists who are embedded in cultural institutions. This represents a significant shift. In the UK, uh, our colleagues at the National Archives uh, have launched uh, some really impressive digital research programs, etc. So the, the landscape is really bustling. Um, almost as an intervention at our end, we just, uh, and I'll tell you who the collaborators are, in January, February, launched our own virtual collaboratory, which is called the Advanced Information Collaboratory, AIC Collaboratory. This was launched at the Alan Turing Institute in London at a, at a meeting. And these are the, the main goals. It's uh, looking at the challenges of disruptive technologies for archives and records management. These include, but are not limited to digital curation, machine learning, AI, etc. Pursue multidisciplinary collaborations, which you will see several examples of today. Leverage um, untested technologies to unlock and discover hidden information in large stores. There's a training educational component, which my colleague Jane Greenberg will, uh, will touch on. And then a very important component that has to be embedded in all of this is uh, the ethical dimension of access and use in the age of uh, big records and big data. So here are some of the founding partners, former colleagues from the National Archives, Mark Conrad, Michael Kurtz, current colleagues at the University of Maryland, Greg Jansen, um, Bill Underwood, um, and then distinguished colleagues from the UK, Irene Gudurali, head of digital research programs at the National Archives, Mark Hedges at King's College of London, uh, Vicky Lemieux at University of British Columbia, and last but not least, are the Dr. Lenise Williams, who heads a really interesting and timely um, collabor collaborative called the Vera Collaborative, which, uh, as part of this intervention, looks at responsible archival practices around visual and material culture of communities of color. Um, there's a really strong focus on looking at these environments for possibilities and opportunities and detection of erasures and including racial and erasure, racial erasures and representational erasure in the, in the context of computational treatments. Um, we've also launched, we have an um, international network of partners, uh, many, of, many of whom are online. I'll, I, I don't want to read the whole list, but I, I, I really should. Um, if we have a little more time, we can come back to this. Dr. Ann Gillen at UCLA, Bruce Ambacher, Sarah Buchanan, um, 
Marisol Ramos, um, and I hope I'm not I'm, I'm I hope I'm not forgetting one. Karen Gracie, etc. So we have colleagues in Europe from major cultural institutions and academic settings. All right, almost there. If you want to know more about this space, go to the CAS portal. I put the link up here. This is part of our AI collaboratory.net uh, virtual organization. Um, there is a solid and interesting body of work that goes back four years now. We've had some 27 workshops since 2016, four major IEEE big data conference, CAS conferences. Um, so if you go to that space, you'll see over 50 papers and slides, um, their presentations, publications, infrastructure, and lots of projects. So I'm listing a few here in orange. These are some of the projects we might touch on today. Um, if you go to the second CAS conference, you'll see these kinds of mappings. This is why it's really archive specific of mapping archival concepts to computational methods. I'll give you a few examples. Classification of archival images can be done with AI. Personally identifiable information, PII. Uh, we have studies and papers that look at NLP and named entity recognition. Decentralized record keeping with blockchain technologies. Matching of records in distributed databases with graph and probabilistic databases, et cetera. So lots, lots of context if you want to dig into this. Uh, here are a few examples of projects. This was a UK-US uh, two-day datathon at the TNA last June. This was in the fall, a very interesting project with cultural partners, densho.org, uh, looking at computational thinking to unlock the Japanese-American World War II camp experience with some really good projects and interesting developments. Okay, so I'm going to end on this section which is um, uh, an accelerated walkthrough um, of a particular case study. And the students then will, will, will walk you through a much more in-depth um, analysis of a project we started working on last fall. So this is the Morgenthau Holocaust Collections Project. Um, Mor Henry Morgenthau was at FDR's Secretary of Treasury for 12 years from 33 to 45. The uh, library there has some 800, over 860 volumes, bound volumes of all of his correspondence, business uh, speeches, interactions, memos, etc. And there's also a uh, an additional series with with over 30,000 index cards into the diaries. So the card on the right is uh, has a label of War Refugee Board and references sections and documents in, in, in bound volume 696. This is the student team. I'd like to acknowledge Renee Geary. She's a practicing uh, uh, librarian. Teddy Ramby is a com computer scientist. Uh, fabulous colleagues at the FDR Presidential Library. So I'm going to show you two quick things. How do you, how do you uh, work on these kinds of projects? What do, what do you do? Well, there was a digital curation portion of this project, and we just started looking at AI and deep learning on these kinds of documents. And the results are, preliminary results are, are really interesting and have a lot of potential. So let's start with the index diaries. This is an index, one index card. We actually go to the website, parse the web page, pull out all the diary PDF files by crawling them. There are 65 uh, of them. We explode them into individual JPEG images, which gives you some 30,000. And then we actually run traditional optical character recognition on each image header. Why, why are we able to do that? It's because um, we kind of know exactly where that information is going to be. It's in the upper left corner. It's, uh, it's spatially segregated. So the traditional methods still work. And then we collect all the resulting text headers. This is what it looks like. You take the card, you OCR it, you extract the header. We apply that to all 30,000 cards. And we actually create, extract an initial set of almost 6,400 headers. They're not unique, but this is something we'll use to validate the artificial intelligence in later steps. The first series, I'm almost there, 
and then we'll hand it over to the student. We'll hand it over to Jane and the students. The the first series is uh, is even more interesting. It's the diaries themselves. If you go to the web page here, you have kind of a workflow. You parse the web page. You extract by crawling all the PDFs, which sometimes are multi-part. You extract the table of content from the first PDF when it's a multi-part. You explode that PDF into individual images. And then you're able to populate this table with metadata that's been extracted from this process. We then use that table in the metadata to create a content tree. So what is a content tree? Well, for the, for the first book, we would use this information and populate a set of hierarchical folders with the table of content exploded pages, the main table of content, and all the data files themselves, which are the, 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 the scanned PDFs of the books themselves. We then run that on all 881, actually, uh, uh, bound books and create a large tree with over 6,000 files and 25 gig of data. Um, and then we're ready to go. So I'll finish on a, on a couple of slides. Bear with me. This is the AI machine learning part. Um, so we are now ready to go to the table of content files. There are 3,579 of these images that we are going to operate on. We essentially build a model to detect sections in, in these images. This is how it's done. We train the model. We essentially annotate a number of pages. We uh, show the algorithm where and what the sections we're trying to pull out look like. And that's done, um, if I go back um, one second here, that's actually done with a Google Cloud machine, learning machine. We then use an image library to crop all those recognized, it's like facial recognition, recognized boxes or faces. So, so we've exploded these 3,500 pages into tens of thousands of small sections. And those, that's our pool for the machine learning. We run that through a second, it's a two-step machine learning AI process. We run that through another deep learning tool. This is what it looks like. And we train it on these little windows. This time, there's not just one label, but there's a bunch of labels. Five, we say this is, this is like facial recognition. We are, this is pre-OCR. We're saying this is, we want to recognize faces in the document, if you like. This is what a nose looks like. This is what eyes look like and where they might be located. These are ears, etc. So we train it again. And the deep learning then goes and identifies all the sections in these carved out documents that look like those things. So we, we train it to recognize headers, content, dates, pages, book numbers. And what comes out of the deep learning process is a, an ontology, a tagged uh, set of attribute value pairs. And, and we, we're gonna collect that information for every single one of these things. So I'm gonna end there, but the, uh, the future is certainly here. Uh, it's also now, and uh, to quote my colleague Mark Conrad, there is an imperative uh, looking at all these developments for educating the archivists and records management of the future uh, for the current and next digital world. This is my, my segue to, to Jane Greenberg, who is going to delve into the educational implications of these new and changing landscapes. So I'll pause here. Thank you. I should share screen now. Yes. <clears throat> okay. First, first, first slide. Everyone's good. Not hearing any complaints. Jane, your your notes are showing. So I don't have any notes. Uh, I don't know how to not display them is there something i should do oh maybe this will do is that better oops okay 
I think I'm gonna go on. Does that sound okay? Um, hi everyone. <laughs> uh, I'm Jane Greenberg. I'm a faculty member at the College of Computing and Informatics, Drexel University. And just sort of to start and say thank you. I'm really excited to be here and thank you to Clear and Rebecca and Azor for really pulling this together. Um, it's a very exciting time. Um, I direct a metadata research center and I, I don't know if you saw me, if any of you are looking, every time Richard said the word metadata, I was going like this. And um, the, that's a big, a big uh, draw for me and the way I've gotten into this computational space um, is uh, sort of it's cliche, but your data is only as good as your metadata is something I say and um, I think is really, really important. Um, what, yeah, so what I'm gonna do is <laughs> focus on uh, the educational aspect and the importance of training and education. And I'm gonna talk specifically about a project called LEADS, which stands for Library Education and data, service, uh, and data science for the, it was developed through support from IMLS, so hats off to IMLS. Um, and just to draw a little bit from the Metadata Research Center and um, why the link between data is that the center that I um, uh, have developed in many collaborators, and you can look up and find out more about that, uh, was founded with a focus on metadata semantics and ontologies and to formalize solutions. And that's so integral to the kinds of work that is going on in the data science space. And particularly with, with this initiative of computational archives. Um, on the first page there, I have a slide. Um, we had an event with the Library Carpentries um, uh, folks and Leeds Fellows, and this was from this January. And uh, several of the Leeds Fellows, we've had six Leeds Fellows uh, through collaborations actually work in the computational archival space and specifically with the, uh, with the um, AI collaborative. So let me move on. Um, so to tell you a little bit about Leeds, uh, the, the program in, was initiated with an emphasis on doctoral students and preparing future educators to bring data science techniques into education, so preparing the next generation. And so engaging doctoral students in immersive ex learning experience with a partner, we, at the time it was called the National Digital Platform. Now the terminology is moving to national information infrastructure. Um, but having some partners that had large corpuses of digital data in, in the library, archival, museum space, and preparing them with skills, but also to be able to integrate this into, into their everyday work, and also to develop curricula, to be confident in developing curricula as they became future educators, and also to build a cohort. And we have had 21 fellows. Uh, we had a, a set of 2018 fellows and 2019 fellows. Um, and we are now hoping to move the program forward in a way that would not only be doctoral students, but early career folks, people on the front line. And um, we, are, we are working on that. Uh, just a little bit more about the, the program. So on the left are our partners, I kept saying National Digital Platform. These are the partners um, that had uh, collections uh, that were considered big data and digital data for the fellows to work with. And each one of these uh, sites had at least one to two and some of them had three um, mentors. Um, that were there, for instance, the DPLA, the Dig Digital Public Library of America, um, the students that worked there had three mentors working with them, OCLC had two, um, the AI Collaboratory, which is uh, the space with Richard, um, Richard and Greg Jensen were uh, serving as mentors. And on the right are some of the, the tools that our students learn to work with. 
And the way the program operated is as students had to apply, um, they were evaluated by mentors and ranked and so forth. And we, we really looked for people who, who um, wanted to get into this space based on their essay um, and um, not necessarily if they had data science skills. We wanted people who, who wanted to learn. And um, we, had, we had more applicants than we could fund, which, which is exciting, meaning that there's interest in this. Um, so um, it was tough, but we were able to fund 21 with, um, over the two years with the, the funding we had. The students who were Leeds Fellows then uh, completed an online uh, data science curriculum. And that was about 15 hours of, of work. Then they came to Drexel and participated in a boot camp. And that was a three day intensive boot camp. And by being together, um, it, it, we helped to form a cohort. And some of the skills and, and techniques that they learned, uh, they had um, uh, sort of lab exercises where they really rolled up their sleeves and worked on things. Um, data mining, NLP, visualization. Uh, there was work on um, curation and data management. Uh, and then uh, students were, some of them were at different levels. So some went a little more in the Python area and some went a little more into the R. Um, and, and they were students who came to the boot camp. They were required to know about their projects before they came so we could help them identify what tools would be, would be good. And then they went and they had a 10 week immersive experience over the summer uh, working with their mentors to, I say, roll up their sleeves and do some work to move a project forward. And uh, great outputs. On this slide here, I'm just, uh, the, six, the six fellows that have, uh, I'm gonna say dovetailed or um, worked in the, ar the computational archival space specifically are listed here. And so uh, at the top are the three of the fellows, uh, Jamela, um, Chris, and, and Adam. And each of those were fellows that were placed at the IA Collaboratory. And let me say, when I say placed, it was virtual. This was all virtual. The only thing that was in person was the, the data intensive boot camp where they came to Drexel and uh, as, as we're facing things now, we know that, that we could do this virtually. Um, and then on the bottom slide, um, so, oh, so let me just say, uh, Jamela worked with the Dencho collection, which Richard has mentioned, and Chris and Adam were, were 2018 fellows and they worked together with the, uh, uh, another collection that the AI Collaboratory has on redlining. Um, of cities and, and um, both did great work. And then at the bottom are Sonia, Sonia Pascoa from Drexel, um, Hanlon from UNC Chapel Hill, and Ming, Ming is in the middle from Missouri. And both Sonia and Hanlon are actually on the call um, and can share their experience. And they had other placements in their LEADS fellowship, but they also went and participated in the Datathon at, at the AIC in Maryland. So uh, just to move on here, um, be mindful of time. So this is just a small slide of leads, uh, leads by the numbers um, and some of the outputs of, of that the fellows um, have come up with. And actually the papers needs to be updated. There are now four papers from students' experiences. And I've listed a few here of, of, of some of the kinds of outputs um, that the students had in terms of participating in Code for Lib, um, you know, in their own institution and so forth. And actually, um, Sonia uh, even went to the Philippines to participate on and share about leads and gave a paper at the Dublin Core Conference. So um, uh, I think this is really my, my last slide. Um, and you can see the leads fellows in the very bottom and other people that have been involved in the, um, the AI um, or the, ar the computational archives and working through uh, Richard Center and this larger effort that the Metadata Research Center is now um, very excited to be connected with. And um, I think this is a perfect segue to turn it over to Lori 
And um, actually just one final thing. I am so impressed at all the, the locations people are coming from. I'd like to make a data map of it. Um, so great. All right, Lori, um, take it away. I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Jane. Um, and welcome everyone. Uh, while I uh, find my screen to share here. Um, my name is Lori Perrine. Uh, my doc I'm a doctoral student um, and a lecturer at the University of Maryland's I school. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and I'm coming from you actually from the traditional hunting grounds of the Piscataway people, the original people who were here in what is now known as uh, Maryland. Um, and so I'm very pleased to be speaking with you today. Um, I, I am going to be presenting to you along with uh, some of my colleagues uh, on a specific project that we did using information from the Maryland State Archives related to slavery in the state of Maryland. And what you see here to begin the presentation is our pictures of the teams that work together on uh, three different uh, data collections. Um, so there is a quite, uh, uh, there's a, a very um, large uh, set of collections related to um, slavery that the um, state archives um, has digitized and made available to the public. Uh, our teams worked on three specific uh, collections, runaway slave ads, So uh, both of these terms may not necessarily be familiar to you, so just very briefly to let you know, uh, a manumission, generically speaking, is some sort of... Laurie, um, I think we missed, oh, we, we have something going on with your mic. It even suddenly, we couldn't hear you, Laurie. Okay, are you able to hear me now? Still the same. Can you speak? Can you hear me now? Yes. No, that's better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, looks like there may have been a switch in the microphone. All right, thank you, Sonia. So, manumissions, um, manumissions and certificates of freedom um, actually have a connection uh, to one another. Uh, manumissions are the, are the legal documentation that an enslaved person has been granted their freedom. Um, in the context of the state of Maryland, that usually is a document that has been filed somewhere legally in a courthouse um, with the legislature. Related to that, in Maryland, um, I'm not sure if this is something that was done, well, I know for sure this is not something that was done throughout the US colonies at the time and then eventually um, what became states, but there were documents that needed to be carried uh, by freed people, whether they were born free or formerly enslaved or manumitted, um, uh, that were called certificates of freedom. So there's that natural connection. Obviously, someone who had a manumission record related to them um, also would have had, um, excuse me, would have had a potential certificate of freedom. So we were looking at those two collections in particular, and in looking at those connections, uh, collections, uh, what we found immediately was that we needed to have some sense of what I'm calling a data biography. You can think of that as the contextualization of the data that we were looking at, and think of that in a very broad way. If we were going to be applying computational thinking, computational methods, we really needed to understand the extent to which Metadata was both explicitly there and what implicitly we need to take into account as we looked at the information. And that meant we needed to know about when, what, who, why, how, where, not just with the digital resources, but also with the original documents as well. And that informed what we eventually used in terms of our computational methods. So we needed to apply this to all phases of our workflow. 
And this just gives you a top level view of what I was just saying, that some of those things that we are thinking about in terms of, let's say, provenance of original documents eventually impacts the datification of those documents and our actual choice of methods and tools when we apply something computationally. And so you can see how all of these, these sorts of attributes will influence ultimately our computational decisions. So several key elements of the data biography um, happen to be the historical context itself. Quite a bit of information on this slide. The two things that I want you to note is that uh, slavery in the state of Maryland uh, was initiated um, in 1642 and eventually abolished in 1865. So there's quite a wide range, a wide date range um, that we're looking at and in which we may potentially find information in our archives. That will become relevant a little bit later in the presentation. Specifically with respect to the manumissions uh, collection, we had to uh, be aware of several factors. One was um, the sort of legal context in which manumissions were made. It turns out that within the state, there was a certain regulation of manumissions beginning around 1692. That's about 50 years after slaves were first and slave people were first brought into the state. And there was eventually at the end of the 18th century, um, in the late uh, 1890s, there was state legislation um, that regulated how manumissions were to occur. So there's a, there are two different legal structures that are governing um, how manumissions may or may not have been recorded. Not only that, um, unlike all of those beautiful files that you saw in the FDR um, collection, um, the original source documents for manumissions were very wildly varied. There were enslaved people who purchased their own, um, their own uh, manumission, their own freedom. That was recorded in a certain way. Um, there were manumissions that occurred via wills and in probate. Um, there were manumissions that were uh, basically property transactions. There were manumissions that occurred because um, enslaved people joined military service uh, for various wars, the Revolutionary War, uh, the War of 1812, the Civil War. There were also manumissions that occurred uh, due to movements that were, uh, that were meant to recolonize uh, black people um, in the US, uh, in the Americas, and to send them back to Africa. So all of those took different forms none of them standardized. By contrast, these certificates of freedom, we found had a little bit more standardization, uh, not, uh, not this sort of lovely standardization that we would find in records keeping today, but more structured um, as uh, when we compare them to the manumissions. These certificates of freedom uh, basically um, were first issued in 1806. This was around about, um, about a decade after um, the state legislation was put into place to regulate. So this, this was actually very early um, in the life of the state of Maryland. But there were clear legal documents. There were certain elements that were common to those legal documents because they were meant to be identification papers. Um, in the Early 19th century, obviously, people weren't carrying around ID cards or driver's licenses or even their passports. Um, they were using these documents, which described them, um, to identify themselves and to say that they had been legally certified um, as freed people um, in the state. So when those original documents were datified, when they were put into digital form, all of those elements were at play. And so what we see is not only all those elements were at play, these were datified over the past decade or so with certain types of technology. And those technologies were primarily two-dimensional uh, relational databases using scanners, um, not really being able to use OCR as much. So you're using visual recognition 
by volunteers who are transcribing information and then that information being put into relational data sets, being cleaned up and then stored using the technology of that time. So what you would have then is something like this, um, where you've got, and this comes from the runaway slave ads, this is a little bit cleaner in terms of being able to interpret and transmit the information. Um, in the runaway slave ads, you've got print as uh, rather than a manuscript, which is what you would have in um, the manumissions documents and in the certificates of freedom. But here, at least, you're able to pull information out relative, relative to the slave owners um, and to the enslaved persons, in this case, fugitive um, enslaved persons. What you'll notice is that there's quite a bit of other information that's contained in this document, which may or may not have been in some way datafied. And so we're beginning to lose a lot of context and a lot of that explicit metadata that is in the text itself that may not have been transferred into the data set. So this is what we began with. We began with that datafied set of information, began to um, enrich our understanding of the data biography to understand what we were working with so that we could then uh, go along this workflow uh, for our computational explorations, sourcing that data, cleaning and wrangling it, filtering out and extracting information that would be relevant or that our technologies would be able to treat, exploring it and visualizing it. And so what you see then is that we have a more enhanced data flow from our original source documents into the computational exploration. We're going to talk about each of those steps in turn, starting with our data sourcing, and the basic sourcing, we basically, here's a, if you go to the website of the Maryland State Archives, if you click on databases, um, it will allow you to look in any of those collections that I've mentioned, and this is what you'll see, and you'll see a page that looks like this. So what we did was we took, we took, uh, we gained uh, access to that data by doing some web scraping using Python. Um, it's a SQL database where things are stored. Um, we um, scraped that database, extracted uh, primary fields. There are also fields that are related um, to some of the records management, um, which was not, some of those were retained, some of them were not. In terms of really us wanting to, to just characterize the data, we weren't so much um, looking for some of those management fields for this particular project. Um, that information was translated into um, a couple of comma separated data tables so that uh, almost any other technology would be able to do so. So what we see now at this point is as we source the data, um, when we're coming from those original documents that there have already been, there has already been quite a bit of loss in translation, literally so, uh, but also in terms of our potential technical translation. So one of the considerations for us, or several of the considerations for us, were, um, once again, looking at that data biography, understanding what metadata was or was not present, um, that we were dealing with relational databases, two-dimensional databases, if you will, and the limits of that, that we had non-standard primary sources. Um, clearly there were some, there were errors that we would need to account for. Um, that there were assumptions that were made in terms of defining data fields that we did not necessarily know and that perhaps the archivist didn't necessarily know. There were assumptions that were made in terms of um, pulling manuscript information out of documents um, and translating that, that we weren't necessarily aware. And so one of the things that we continuously had to keep in mind was how well were the meaning of those documents and the relationships um, that were originally embedded in those documents, how well were those captured by the digitized representations that we had and how well could we actually preserve some of that in our digitized representation? What elements were lost or ignored? Why? And who decides? 
what elements are retained and not retained. I'm going to ask uh, my colleague Philip um, to talk about some of the specific challenges that we had in terms of data sourcing. Thanks, Lori. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Philip, and I worked on the Certificates of Freedom data set with Rajesh. And we noticed while we were exploring the Certificates of Freedom data set, we noticed some, uh, some unusual information that was captured in the data set. So we had to check the original documents. We found some transcription errors. And in this sample currently being shown in the Certificate of Freedom for Joseph Codwell, we noticed that the original clerk documented Codwell's county of origin as Talbot County, but the transcriber actually recorded Baltimore County in the Excel spreadsheet. And then on to the next slide. In this Certificate of Freedom for Jeremiah Brown, we noticed that the original clerk who documented this record did not capture the day as it could have been seen from the highlighted part here, due to which the transcriber captured it as a date with the incorrect format with only a year and a month, in this case as 1840-06. But to, to be consistent with the other date records, we had to transform this date by adding an arbitrary day as the first day of June, 1840. On the next slide. While we were exploring their Certificate of Freedom data set on Excel, we noticed that the transcriber listed the heights and feet and inches of the former slaves now freed people in a com one combined column in Excel instead of a separate columns. So we also noticed that the transcribers listed Abraham as being 9.75 feet tall, which is unusually tall. <laughs> and on the next slide. In this certificate of freedom for Susanna, we noticed that the transcriber listed her as being 100 years old in the Excel spreadsheet, but the original records list her age as 80 or and 20 years old, so we're not really sure. So therefore, Susanna could potentially be 20 years old or in, instead of being um, 80 years old. And this concludes some of the transcription errors that we found, so I will turn it back over to Lori. Thank you, Philip. So as we said, um, there, there are a lot of decisions that are being made about what is captured and what is not. Um, and as I pointed out before, even when we've got information that may be more easily, uh, easy to interpret because it comes in a print form, um, there is information that may or may not be captured. Um, here is an individual um, who, is, uh, who is integral to this particular event or transaction that's occurring and who's not necessarily captured in the database as well as some of the other information here about place and time. Once we have the data, um, we're taking into account all of these possible um, uh, omissions, uh, errors, um, cleaning them, uh, and uh, then filtering out what's important for us to begin to um, characterize the data as well. So we can think of that as data wrangling, um, we used uh, various resources, primarily OpenRefine, which is an open source um, data cleaning uh, software, um, and R, uh, which is also open source, but takes a little bit more training um, to use. Uh, Rajesh, um, if you could please talk to us about cleaning um, in the Certificates of Freedom collection. Um, sure, thanks, Lori. My name is Rajesh Nanasekaran, and uh, as Philip pointed out, um, um, we both worked on the Certificates of data, Freedom Dataset Collection. Uh, while cleaning this data set, we found that there were issues with formatting of few fields, fields as a result of uh, incorrect transcription, maybe, right? So for example, the field um, date issued, um, of the date of uh, issue for the Certificate of Freedom was captured and available as a string field and due to limitations on Excel, which does not properly format dates prior to 1900, we had to use a custom field calculation on a tool, uh, visualization tool like Tableau, to convert the string field into a pop proper date format. 
so that we could uh, visualize the observations in a time series um, trend, uh, which will be explained later on. For the field age, um, which is shown to the right box, um, it indicates the age of uh, enslaved person at the time of document creation. And we found that for ages less than a year, that is for the enslaved person um, who, who has an age less than a year, in order to indicate the number of months, the transcriber uh, has, has captured the decimal, uh, the month as a decimal of a year, year which is uh, incorrect because uh, there is a, we need to properly convert them into uh, correct fractions of a year. So we did that as you could see in this box. On the next slide, <clears throat> uh, here we see data cleansing effort related to the field prior status of the enslaved person uh, during the documentation. Uh, this field had mostly transcription issues with different types of entries for the same term like born free or free born, et cetera. So we had to classify them uh, into uh, generic four types um, and the highlighted category, um, one of those categories which says descendant of a white female, we had to do some research on that uh, to find out which, which of the four categories these uh, observations can go into. And we found that it should be classified as freeborn um, as children born of the white female were considered to be free which was found upon research. On the next slide, uh, we see here how uh, we handled a complex uh, data feature, uh, the complexion of the enslaved person who was, uh, and how it was captured by the uh, clerk um, when, while documenting the certificate of freedom. And for a few challenges in handling this feature, uh, which are listed here, are the different ways the clerk documented complexion uh, from their own um, interpretation, uh, interpretation because it is subjective. And, the, and they also uh, you know, interpreted complexion and docu uh, documented them uh, in terms of colloquial words like mulatto, copper, or wood, et cetera, and which were not consistent between uh, each uh, county clerks. And there were spelling errors and there were inconsistencies in identifying complexion between each counties. One, one county recorded it as something and there is another county recorded it as a different one. And, and also some of the documentation were elaborate uh, where, you know, instead of a bird or two, they just um, had so many birds to fit in that feature. Uh, so in order to classify them, we, we performed some clustering using open refined tool. And, and classified these complexion into seven broad categories uh, from bright to black uh, with light brown, medium brown, and dark brown among other class of categories. Um, that's all we have for cleaning from the certificates of freedom. Now back to Lori to discuss cleaning with the manumissions collection. Thank you, Rajesh. Um, in, with the manumissions documents, um, we worked primarily uh, with R, in R, um, to, um, to clean the data, um, to um, structure it um, in a way that we could actually begin to um, get, make some sense of it. Um, and so, as we noted before, there were quite a bit of non-standard entries um, in each record. Um, we weren't sure that we were always going to get the same information <laughs> um, in, in different records, and there are quite a few records you'll see um, later that there were thousands and thousands of records in the um, collections. We had to replace lots of um, null values. Um, and uh, just like with the certificates of freedom, we had all kinds of interesting uh, transcription errors. For instance, our maximum age turned out to be 237 years, um, which we figured was probably incorrect. Um, so we went into um, to modify that or to, in this case, I think we put it as simply uh, not representative or not applicable. But the thing um, that was really challenging for us is that with, um, with these um, manumissions documents, we found that we had multiple, multiple date fields um, that were available. And I don't know if this is large enough for you, can, for you to see, but there are approximately four different types of dates that were recorded in this collection. Sometimes there were null values for those dates, and sometimes they were filled in. So we were very puzzled by this. We couldn't really understand what was going on with it. 
And what we eventually understood and what we eventually learned by looking at the original sources and talking to um, the archivists and the historians is that um, there were manumissions may have been granted or registered on one date, but may not have been valid until another date, for example. Um, and that is something called a deferred manumission. There had to be, we had to figure out some way, we had to make some decisions to have um, a single year or date that would allow us to do um, comparisons uh, with uh, other collections. And so we basically programmed uh, an algorithm um, to clean up the, all of the date fields, but then also to find of what appeared to be the most viable year for us to use so that we could go on to visualize the data as well. So the other very important thing here was that there was tons and tons and tons of unstructured information in the notes um, that we did not pull out on this round, but which we would like to look at um, as we continue with our explorations. Uh, finally, as we sought to um, eventually look at connections between our manumissions collection um, and our Certificates of Freedom collection. Uh, what we discovered almost immediately was that there were fields that, you know, if we were just doing a basic data merging or matching, uh, fields that had the same names but had very different information in them. Um, so there um, had to be a modification, uh, a syncing of that information as well. And then, of course, there were the standard spelling and transcription errors. We're going to talk a bit now um, about the exploration that we did, and that's very much tied in with the visualization as well. So we'll, um, you'll, you'll see a bit of overlap in that. Um, a lot of the exploration um, that we did, uh, once again, used uh, uh, open source, or Tableau is not totally open source, but used um, software like Tableau um, and R um, in order for us to look at the information. Um, we first just ran some basic analytics. And what I want you to notice is that we had to do all of that cleaning, all of that investigation, just to get <laughs> the data set um, into a place where we could talk about how, how many records do we have? Um, what's the geographical coverage um, as we clean the data? Um, what years um, were covered by our data? Um, here, um, if you um, remember, I talked about this thing that's called deferred manumissions. We were very puzzled when we saw manumission states um, in 1870 when slavery had ended um, at the end of the Civil War, 1864. So trying to figure out what was happening there. Um, that allowed us, once we discovered that, that allowed us to go back and fix our algorithms so that we could um, adjust our years. Um, age range of the, um, of the persons being manumitted or being granted certificates of freedom. Um, the male-female composition, what jumps out immediately um, is are that the, uh, most of the certificates of freedom are granted to males. And we can think of many, many reasons um, why that could be possible, um, including um, head of household. Um, society in the 19th century is going to be um, focused on the male um, in a household, but we also have to remember that um, enslaved people, households were primarily broken up, um, and uh, quite a few enslaved females were retained um, for uh, purposes of um, continuing to produce children who would then be um, enslaved. Um, so there, there are interesting factors that um, are um, corroborated or come to light as we see that um, as well. Uh, one of the things that I'll point out to you uh, that were said in terms of the statistics um, on the prior slide is that we quickly saw that the information that we had did not cover the entire state of Maryland. For example, um, these are in the manumissions collection. Um, we found um, these, rec these are the, the various um, counties in Maryland. Uh, so we found that most of the records that we had in manumissions were from uh, Anne Arundel County. Um, and it looks, oh, I'm very sorry. It looks like I've left Anne Arundel off um, this. But Anne Arundel County has um, about um, 3,700 uh, records and Queen Anne's County. 
Um, whereas we had very few records from some of these other counties. So immediately we realized um, that we actually didn't have information about the full state and that in during, doing some of our analysis, we might want to obviously just uh, focus on a few of those as well. Um, another, uh, here's a nice little visualization um, that we did in looking at the age distribution of manumissions records by county. Uh, once again, you get a sense of the age at which these manumissions were um, granted, some um, relatively earlier um, than others. You see outliers in some situations. Here you get um, uh, Anne Arundel, uh, which had the largest uh, set of records as well. But that immediately gives you a sense of um, how old people were when their freedom was granted, or at least promised to them. We did a little bit further visualization as well. Um, I'm not gonna show you all of that, <laughs> but just a few examples. Um, when we visualize the certificates of freedom information in Tableau, um, here, um, once again, this is showing um, both the, basically the um, frequency, um, how many um, uh, certificates of freedom were granted at a particular time, um, and the gender distribution. And what you'll notice with this darker pattern here, these are the females. Um, the female um, granting of uh, certificates of freedom to females um, really um, wasn't until um, the 18, mid 1830s into the 1840s um, where we were coming across those sorts of records. And obviously, as you saw before, much um, smaller number. And then you have this interesting spike here. I'll come back to that in a moment. Here's another visualization that we did this time in R um, using two different um, techniques. Both uh, visualizations are showing the same thing. Uh, the frequency distribution of manumissions documents by year, by county. Um, this uh, particular graph is a histogram, um, which gives you a little bit more uh, sense of the shape um, of, that, of that frequency distribution. We see um, quite a few, um, we see this peak that occurs and then suddenly a drop off. Um, and then uh, just a, a, an unsteady pattern here. This is another way to visualize the same information. It doesn't quite give you um, uh, the pattern as well here, but does give you um, a sense of, um, as you follow the dots of where and when um, information occurs. So one of the things we saw right away is that when we could compare um, visualizations, even across data sets, uh, we're noticing that there are patterns of information. So that interesting peak that we saw in the certificates of freedom corresponds with this odd drop off um, in the manumissions collection. What does that mean? What happened in 1831? So we went back to our context, to our data biography, and what we noticed were two seminal events um, occurring in Maryland around that time. Uh, the first uh, was the initiation of something called the Maryland Colonization Society. Um, this was one of those movements to repatriate, um, to recolonize um, enslaved uh, Africans um, to take them back to Africa. And as a matter of fact, quite a few manumissions in this period um, were designed specifically um, so that the slaves could be, uh, the formerly enslaved could be sent back to Africa. There was also a little bit of trouble in the state of Virginia, next door to Maryland. Um, a gentleman by the name of Nat Turner led a rebellion of slaves um, in that state um, where uh, that was nearly successful and which greatly frightened um, slaveholders um, in the state of Virginia and Maryland and beyond. So at that point in time, uh, Maryland um, cut down on the ability of uh, free blacks from entering the state and also um, sort of put a moratorium on manumissions for a time being so that they could um, essentially using that as a prevention mechanism um, against possible revolts or rebellions. As I mentioned earlier, um, and we're, we're uh, heading into the last part of our presentation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of our key interests was seeing um, if we would be able to link records um, across the data collections. 
Um, this had its challenges um, because of some of the issues that I've raised before. Um, we identified what might be reasonable um, data fields to use in our linking. Um, and then once again, as we looked at our data biography, uh, one of the things that we saw was that there were really only um, a few of those fields that would be available to us. Um, uh, we, could, uh, we could link with respect to geography, um, county, um, with a certain degree of certainty. We already saw there were transcription errors with respect to county as well. Owner, uh, at owner uh, last name and first name was pretty um, steady. We had, uh, there may have been misspellings, uh, but we had a certain degree of certainty there. Because of the practices at the time, we were not able to link um, slave na last name with a freed last name because it was a common practice either to not give a last name to an enslaved person or once an enslaved person had attained his or her freedom, they would adopt a new last name uh, in celebration of their freedom. So we had to focus on first names. And as we um, note, or, uh, another thing, I don't think we noted this, but age, uh, which originally thought we might be able to match with respect to age, but since records were not kept uh, on um, birth dates um, for enslaved people, that was not reliable as well. So once we get that connection, uh, we did some visualizations. I'm going to ask Rajesh to talk about um, how we used um, uh, uh, graph database um, software uh, to look at those connections. Thanks again, Lori. Uh, in this couple of slides, uh, we wanted to share with you how we used um, contextual uh, uh, matching to properly link the manumissions and uh, certificates of freedom collections and represent them as uh, graph or network visualizations. Uh, in the picture shown um, in the middle of the slide, um, we see that uh, in a graph representation, each um, circle uh, is a node and uh, the blue circle here shows one documented observation from uh, certificates of freedom and each manumission observation uh, is shown in red, and the orange circles shows the uh, in, um, each slave owner, which was a unique collection which we added for this purpose. Uh, the relationships between the nodes or the lines which connect, uh, indicating that a slave owner named, for example here, a slave owner at the top, named uh, William Franklin, um, owned an enslaved person whose first name was Sook and last name was Snull, uh, just like Lori mentioned earlier. Um, and similarly, another slave owner owned a different person under the same name as per their individual certificates of freedom documents. Now, without using any contextual knowledge, when we tried to link the enslaved person using their first and last name, only their first and last name between certificates of freedom and manumission documents, we see that both these enslaved persons in blue connect to one red circle, uh, indicating a data integrity error because the manumission document did have two different persons by the same name. However, their matching criteria was not uh, right. In the next slide, <clears throat> now based upon our data analysis and understanding the context of the data and why, um, uh, the last name uh, uh, and first name is not the only, could not be the only matching criteria. Then we included other fields into the matching uh, algorithm, as Lori indicated earlier, by including fields like county owner's first name, owner's last name, and enslaved person's first name. We were able to properly connect the nodes to their individual records from both the certificates of freedom and the manumission data. Now we see here, there are, uh, from the blue circle, we see two uh, connections going to the um, individual manumitted uh, records of, uh, of their own um, a slave, uh, enslaved person's record. Uh, now, we found this way of representing and visualizing digital archi archival data to be interesting and hence wanted to share with you. Although the contextual analysis of identi identifying the key connecting fields were manual, and there is some scope to automate and improve on that. 
Uh, this would be one of the many future steps to take this project forward, um, which would be explained by Lori. Back to you, Lori. Thank you, Rajesh. So we're, uh, folks, we're finishing up this part of our presentation. Just two more slides. Um, so obviously, um, th there's, this is some foundational work um, that we can build on. Um, so what we could do um, as some next steps are take some of these visualizations, expand upon them, um, and create data um, dashboards with them. Um, uh, dashboards that are interactive in certain ways, using time lapse, um, looking at interconnections between the collections that we're uh, looking at, and also really just uh, doing some nice static presentations of what we have available. Uh, I mentioned that we uh, have these uh, notes fields that are full of textual information. Um, and so we can be using um, some current data science techniques to begin to mine those and to uncover addi additional individuals, additional events, relationships, that we can then begin to visualize using some of these um, graphical database technologies um, that have just been uh, presented to you. Um, and of course, we're looking at, um, continuing to look at how we can enhance and potentially automate cross-collection connections, not just with manumissions and certificates of freedom, but through some of the other collections that are available um, at the Maryland State Archives. Um, one of the things we'd love to do is develop a set of case studies where we're tracking um, specific individuals across those collections, from manumissions to certificates of freedom, through census collections, through other collections that then give us a sense of the life of an individual that previously uh, may not have been visible um, in our records. And we want to look at, are there ways that we can extend um, some of the um, some of the metadata that is, um, that it's, is attached to these databases so that we can make for better representations when we're using graph database technology. Um, there's some suggested research topics. These are not exhaustive. Um, there certainly is quite a bit of work um, that can be done related to ontologies for collections that are related to slavery. Um, there has been um, actually a recent um, recent paper, um, there was an article um, out in January. Um, this particular paper, which is referenced at the bottom of the slide, is coming out in August um, for colleagues at the, I think it's uh, at uh, Michigan, University of Michigan, who have done an ontology related to the transatlantic trade slave, uh, transatlantic slave trade. Um, but one of the things that we see here is there's some very specific elements within this particular set of collection, uh, certificates of freedom, which is not necessarily part of the story of slavery elsewhere. Um, the relationship with the manumissions and also the legal construct, which would uh, um, invite us to look at um, some, some other variations of ontology and invite us to look at ways that we can represent um, multiple perspectives of lived experience during that time, rather than being centered perhaps on uh, the slave owner um, in this respect. Um, how might we uh, look at extending metadata for these and other similar connections, obviously uh, in relationship to the ontologies, or retrofit um, in, in order to enhance the ability to um, access information across um, collections? And then as we begin to look at using machine learning and other data science techniques so that we can actually automate some of this discovery, um, what are the types of probability models um, that we would need to use um, with this type of data? So that um, ends uh, my part of the presentation. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Richard and Jane, if they might have some concluding words, and perhaps we can then squeeze in a few of the Q&A. You've all been very prolific in your questions, um, but thank you. Um, Richard, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh. Sorry, I have muted myself. Just have a few slides to, to talk about next steps, and then um, we can go back to you. So let me bring those up.
Can you all see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, just a few additional references if you want to follow up on this. There's a really exciting, very important dimension we didn't touch on so far, but it's well represented in this body of work. And I, I just want to um, um, give you a few references, should this interest you or should you want to work with us or follow up. And this has to do with uh, what some people are calling computational thinking. Before we do that, I have a URL for our next IEEE Big Data Computational Archival Science Workshop. It'll be the fifth year we do this. Um, I'm sorry, it's not, there's a typo there, I'll correct it. It's not Los Angeles. It's in this mid-December, it will be in Atlanta, Georgia. I'll update that. And there's a call for proposals there, which uh, with a deadline uh, sometime in October. So, so there's a dimension which is computational thinking. This has been a very useful framework for us. And let me uh, go there. Indeed, we have a project that's funded by IMLS called Developing a Framework for Mapping Computational Thinking into Library Archival Science Education Research, so CT Laser. There's a reference here. We're about to conclude this project. It was a, a little over a year project that you might find interesting. It's the final report. Essentially, I have three bullets. Those are some of the takeaway messages that um, we're, we, we've essentially extended this CAS work. Um, and we are, we're very clear and convinced that computational thinking is an important dimension that needs to be part of these investigations, certainly part of the training and learning um, space, in particular for MLIS, but also for training people who are in the field and practitioners and professionals. There's an effort right now, um, for those of you who might be interested in that, to develop what we're calling CT or computational thinking enhanced lesson plans that we can then share so that, so that we can um, leverage our collective work and build on our insights and developments. And I have another link to that. It's a framework where we are posting case studies. They're recorded in this thing called Jupyter Notebooks, which is a way of telling computational stories and running these stories. So it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, format that's very popular in data science. So we're trying to bring that over to the archival space to create a framework that, that will allow the recording and sharing of, um, of knowledge uh, studies, including lesson plans, which we're about to work on next. And then finally, we launched recently this, uh, this network this work, as, as eloquently demonstrated by the students, is highly interdisciplinary. You, you, you can't do this alone. You need uh, teams and collaborations. So the intent of the AIC collaboratory uh, network is precisely uh, to create a community of interest, to learn from one another. So I really invite you to connect with us. We'd like to grow this space. and. Uh, this is probably the only way to, to move the field forward. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to finish with uh, a few additional references, which are, which are really solid in this space. So one of our collaborators on this grant was uh, David Weintrop, who established a, uh, what he calls a uh, taxonomy for computational thinking. It's essentially a set of 22 building blocks that fall in these verticals, things that relate to data, things that relate to modeling. You can think of artificial intelligence, deep learning as modeling as well. Things that relate to problem solving, things that relate to systems thinking practices. For example, how do you think in levels? How do you uh, break down a complex system, etc.? So there, there are several references here that really help with this. So David Weintraub has done this mapping from CT to STEM. Part of our work in our collaborative is to go from CT to library and archives. So CT laser. 
My colleague Bill Underwood, formerly from Georgia Tech, who's actually online right now, has, uh, has a couple of really, really good references at the fourth CAS conference. He took all the workshop papers and mapped them into this taxonomy in terms of which um, archival um, science ideas were expressed and how they reference potentially computational thinking um, topics. So very, very significant paper. Uh, there's also a second paper, that's the, the last one there, CT Laser Practice, which takes these 22 building blocks and maps them, validates them one at a time, um, and relates them to well-known archival, uh, archival science case studies uh, that are published and they're out in the field. So it's kind of a two-way validation. So th these are very important papers. And I'll end um, on this note, uh, just to, to give you a little more fodder if, you're, if you wanna get into this. Two papers that relate to our partnership with dencho.org and um, Jeff Fro in particular on PII with uh, World War II Japanese American incarceration camps and also a more recent project, a more, more recent paper in the fall. These are, these are both part of our CAS workshop series or published there. You can look at the slides, you can look at the papers and this is the third and the fourth, which has five case studies with some 20 students. And, and there we have connected all the case studies explicitly. They all reference the same set of 22 computational building blocks. So, um, to, um, to paraphrase uh, my colleague uh, uh, Jane, the, what, we're, what we're moving towards here is, is, a, is a metadata vocabulary, a sort of taxonomy to capture computational metadata, if you will, or to be able to describe computational experiments in archival spaces and describe them in a coherent and consistent way using a controlled vocabulary um, that allows us to relate these different case studies, to contrast them, to link them, et cetera. And that's what we're building into this cases website infrastructure, a systematic way of thinking about computation and a systematic way increasingly of developing computational archival science projects. We think this is really, really significant. It's a major breakthrough in the four years I've been involved with this effort. Um, and uh, if you look at these two uh, case studies, I think you'll get a good sense of why um, um, I'm, I'm stating that this is actually a significant progress and, a, and kind of a breakthrough in terms of uh, how we can move forward. So I'm going to stop here um, and stop sharing my screen and hand it back to the organizers. Thank you very much. Jane, I'm sorry, uh, I, I quoted you, but I, I, uh, I was channeling you. Um, you. You may want to jump in as well. I think it's good to turn it over. Uh, just, just thank you, you know, and uh, let's, let's let the organizers um, take, carry over. So thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Dr. Azure Stewart. I'm one of the organizers along with um, Dr. Rebecca Bayek. Um, so this concludes their presentation portion. So now we're going to address some of the questions that you guys have put in the queue. Um, if there are any other additional questions that you would like um, for us to address, please make sure and add it in in the Q&A section. Um, so I'm going to first start off on um, one of the attendees had discussed um, that um, they are using manumission um, for their work in um, Puerto Rico. It's just more of a commentary um, about um, thank you guys for sharing your research. Um, the next question I really want to get into is what is the timeline for a project like this? How long have you been working with this data? And any one of you from the team can answer this question. 
Yeah, let me take this tab on that. So our data done is a culmination of eight weeks of data exploration in the DCIC then, but now a um, AI collaborate, uh, co collaborative. It was in September and October and uh, there were 17 students, undergrad, masters and doctoral students um, work on those. So eight weeks of data exploration. Thank you. Um, the next question looks like one of the participants says it looks like CAS and participation is focused on datafying digitized material. Is there also experience with digital born material and, for instance, appraisal? Um, now, although extremely interesting, it sounds like more like um, computational historical science than archival science. I don't know who on the team wants to answer. I, it's Jane. I just want to add to the last one and just say, in some respects, you know, th that those are, Sonia's answer was great, and that's the chunk of time she was able to give. But these projects are never finished in some ways because they're just, there's so much that we can learn once we get them computational. So I just, you know, other ways to mine it and look at the data. But so I can't. Mm -hmm. It's forever working project when you're dealing with research. So there's never a there, there, you know, just more angles and different visions to it. So, so maybe I can jump in to, to answer that question, we're, we're, we had a, a project that just ended a year and a half ago, which was a collaboration with the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois called Brown Dog, which was funded by the National Science Foundation. And it utilized a lot of the same methodologies and techniques that you're seeing today. Um, and it was entirely, well, not entirely, but predominantly based on born digital records. So, so the really interesting conversations are these conversations at the intersection of born digital, which is absolutely essential. You saw the, the reference at the beginning to um, the new policies OMB National Archives are, are putting out in particular that uh, in moving forward all uh, records transmitted and feeds uh, will, will, will be di digitized, datafied and born digital. So that's the future we're moving into. Um, I think we can learn a lot with these uh, sort of forensic deep dives, which is what you saw with the students. And the, um, I think this is an interesting research question is figuring out um, what you can do with uh, born digital and datafied content and uh, what points of intersection you have and where the techniques simply diverge. And, um, but we're definitely interested in in, um, in the live and, um, and um, historical science as well. That's, that's, um, that's part of a number of our projects, including this National Science Foundation project. Thank you. Um, I wanna address um, in the next question, uh, many of folks have been asking about, will this be recorded? Yes, it has been recorded. We will load it to the Emerging um, technolo Technologies website, but also through YouTube. So we will also have it posted and available for those of you who want a reference with colleagues or for further exploration. I'm gonna dive into the next question. Um, it says, how much have you looked into collaborating with archival practitioners outside of cultural heritage organizations or academia? Uh, I love the approach um, of building a, an educational framework and increasing scholarship, but um, archival science practitioners and archivists have been doing this kind of systems thinking in a wide variety of disciplines, including with born digital collections and big data. Uh, I see a lot of discussion happening um, with data scientists, digital archive scholars, but um, not practicing archivists. Um, we can learn a lot from each other. I, I can jump in for, and then somebody else can carry on. 
So um, just with the LEADS project, that is the intent uh, for us as we continue um, to really reach out to people on the front lines in the field, in these institutions, not just in the academic uh, setting, you know, in the classroom setting, people that are working on the front lines, um, serving as mentors, and then early career, and, and, and actually in the original LEADS program, some of these folks on the front lines who have, who are in archives and libraries have served as mentors. So we want to build stronger links. Um, and so early career folks, people who are out in the field who didn't necessarily have this training is also um, important to, to form those links. I don't know. Richard, do you want to? Sure, no, it's, uh, um, we really want to build couldn't, bridges. Couldn't this agree, is, couldn't agree more with the, with the comment, this is not, uh, this cannot be an academic uh, venture. It is not from our perspective. We're all working. Um, not all of it is reflected in these slides, but I'd be happy to follow up. But we are, uh, we have active collaborations with uh, practitioners, professionals in the field. Um, those are the, those, those, those are the drivers. That's where our our students uh, end up being in these spaces. So there, there is no dichotomy. It is all connected. Um, with uh, Mark Conrad, I'm teaching a digital curation for information professionals certificate class right now with professionals in the field. Um, you have folks with decades of experience who are coming back and developing these skills and, and working with us. You also have folks who have just recently graduated we're talking just a few years ago, who are coming back uh, and sharing their expertise and who uh, realize in their institutions, which are not um, just cultural institutions, their financial records, their international groups, their business records, they're, they're all over the map, but who are realizing that these are really essential skills. And there is a, allegedly a point of rub intention here is that it's it's um i think high schools mlis programs need to step up to this challenge um not not all the faculty are comfortable with this yet which is uh, which is normal it's very collaborative as you as we hope we demonstrated today administrators aren't always uh, supportive uh students um uh, tend to skirt away from these things so we just we, we just need to provide more opportunities for learning and collaboration and doing it with practitioners is absolutely essential. As a matter of fact, we have a few grant proposals that are in the works that are precisely uh, bringing academics and practitioners and librarians, archivists from a various ilk together. It's essential. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And can I, can I also <laughs> talk? Okay, so um, there are really a lot of takeaways from this project and I learned a lot, but what I could highly um, point out is that, you know, um, in, 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 in an existing field focus on, on different issues, which is actually digital data issues in humanity. There's actually an existing field focus on this, which we call digital humanities, you know, creating communities of practice that allow projects to be federated with each other is likely, you know, what I, um, um, as I said, uh, what I took as a learning um, opportunity for everyone. So as, as you mentioned, we can learn from each other. Really, we do need each other to work hand in hand with every project because it, 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 it doesn't only concern data, but it also concerns human and humanities. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, it's a complex issue with multiple actors that you guys need to have involved to accomplish the work to move forward, so. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I move on to the next question. Um, one of the attendees asked, do you recommend to start a project uh, with document digitization or um, with data practices? And it's up to whoever thinks 
this would be the best question that they can address. I can give the short answer and then or do, do any of do any of the fellows or anybody want to say anything first? And I think I can provide my okay, go ahead. opinion go ahead. after your, your initial thought or do you have any? Okay, I will go for it. So I as hello I'm Halin. So I'm initially starting from this uh computational archives, like uh efforts from James, like projects from Leeds where I learned uh, something and it's especially about how to deal with data and then later we have offered to like to computational archive and from my like personal experience I think like both ways are valid and both ways have its own like a uh, good thing and challenges so for me it's just like my personal preference like document uh, document digitalization is gonna be somehow more challenging as we identify those issues in this presentation. They're gonna be transcribing errors. They're gonna be a higher requirements on learning the context of the entire the background of your data, and then how to digitalize it, and it's different or or. Other, on the other hand, with data practices, because if we have, like, like in this project, the data was offered to students was provided by the Maryland State Archive. This, so the students are more focusing on the practice side of doing, practicing what they learned in school and what they have like uh, experienced. And they are, so I think it's more somehow easier for students to like participate in a way such that they have some like thing, they have some foundation they could build on instead of spending the eight week time to learn the rich in context of how a, the documents the, should be and what's the value behind. But that's just my like initial thoughts and anyone could jump in and like provide Anyone else wants to jump in? Um, I don't remember the, the exact specifics of the question, but I, I, I mean, my initial answer in thinking through this is, I mean, it depends on what you want to get out of it. You know, what's your learning objective? Um, um, and what is your, your research question or service that you want to provide? So, um, but you know, having the foundational skills and keeping building them and increasing them with any with any project, um, you know, there's there's the learning curve. Um, and and I think this infrastructure we we prototyped this last year that we hope to develop further, which is this cases computational archival science cases. Um, will increasingly reflect that diversity and you will have born digital data sets, you will have uh, a variety of provenances so that so that a whole range of interventions can be illustrated and 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 these these we hope to package them as learning modules so that people almost like you know going online these days and taking a class so that you could kind of pick and choose a point of entry into this space and decide how how you want to learn and navigate based on your preferences and background anyone else have anything they want to add we'll move on to the next question um, one of the attendees um, has said, given the translation issues that pervade the relationship between archival context and computational um, datafication, i.e. losing context and creating new ones throughout the data datafication process, um, what have you learned about archival practices before and um, computational mechanisms today 
uh, specifically with the case study presented today. So let me start just one. Um, not only about this case study, but um, my, my current um, project. So I'm currently doing a project with the USA National Health Institute. This is through the National Center for Translational Science. So this is really kind of um, um, a related you know, answer to the question. So this um, National Center for Translational Science are developing biomedical data translator it aims to advance the development of high need cures and reduce significant barriers between research discoveries and clinical trials. So we are developing kind of um, um, a comprehensive relational and dimensional biomedical data translation, translator, I, I mean, that integrates multiple types of existing data sources and this include not only the objective signs and sy symptoms of disease, drug effects, intervening types, and biological data relevant to um, understanding um, path uh, pathophysiology. We are also looking at archival pathophysiology. Now, archival practices and computational mechanisms were bo are both helping us today in shaping the frameworks of our workflow. So. This project is a kind of work of 18 clusters of different, you know, professionals from the field of um, um, art archives, um, library and information science, from medical field, from programmers. So, um, as I said earlier, and uh, as you also mentioned, there's really this complex system that we do we deal right now and interdisciplinary multidisciplinary is really necessary and we need to work hand in hand together archives are very essential we are looking at them right now to to understand the series of protein that we need to to um, um, understand in terms of reading the researches that were done previously So I hope it helps. Thank you, Sonia. Does anyone else have anything they want to add to this question to follow up? So we move on to um, this next last question. Um, one of our participants wants to know, do we need to have some practical training to use artificial intelligence in the archives? I can try to jump in. So for practical training, I think there are I see two layers of this question. So for training, do you mean, I think one way we can do it is like, do uh, archive, archive, like people working in archive, like community need to learn how to use like uh, artificial intelligence. And I feel like, uh, sorry, let me rephrase it. So for artificial intelligence, this can be a very large concept. Like we can have algorithms to help like digital lives and do OCR on some like real collections where the handwriting is like differs by types of documents. Or we can have like uh, artificial intelligence for say alg like a uh, machine learning algorithm to try to do classification, like ask the, let's say, beat the, a classifier with a thousand documents and ask the machine to say, okay, do you think how many different type of documents are here? Maybe machine could say we have three types. We have like runaway slave ads. We have kind of like a uh, manumissions. We have different types. There are a variety of things that machine learning or AI could do. And that really depends on what like uh, you want to do. So the types of answer is very different. And sorry, that's clear. I hope that clarifies the AI part a little bit. And then it's the training part. For training and 
they are like in machine learning in the domain of machine learning people call training is because you need to have some like manually label document for like for those like uh one type of algorithm that is part the sorry uh that part sorry <laughs> that meant my got stuck. okay so basically there are two types of algorithms one is you do not need to provide any like uh training data it's like classification algorithms or uh, it's like clustering algorithm but for classifications and for predictions you probably need some manually labeled data and for the training uh okay for the training part you can have some manually labeled data and feed it to the algorithm and the algorithm can learn from what people have manually labeled and then is like then it can build on and do predictions after learning from that and that is learning from the uh, machine learning perspective training sorry and then they're also training on people how to need to on people how need to learn how to use those algorithms and they are like uh, courses online uh, on machine learning and there are also a lot of events and like Richard, Dr. Richard Marciano and is trying to investigate here, like to have doctoral students who have, who have the skills and working with archivists and we like we learn from each other this kind of situation. And all right, I, I think that this question is a little bit I answer is a little bit too wordy and that could I hope someone can provide better. I, I just I just want to add that I think the, the best projects we've had and continue to have our, our multidisciplinary or our project. First of all, we, everything we try to do to answer your question is kind of learning by doing. That's our philosophy. So you can certainly read about the theory, take classes. Um, but in all our projects these last few years, and we've had over 300 students and practitioners embedded in these kinds of projects, we've always tried to put together um, interdisciplinary teams where you have at least uh, one librarian, one archivist, computer science folks. Those are the most interesting and the best projects. And I think there is a, there is sort of a human dimension to that, which is in moving forward, all these kinds of digital projects will be highly interdisciplinary. The complexity is beyond, um, certainly beyond me, beyond uh, most of us. And you need teams. And when you, when you have an archival perspective with a technological perspective and folks understand and develop the kind of confidence that, that is really needed in moving forward, that you don't have to be an IT expert or an AI expert, but can still contribute to the conversation and add value at, from, from all kinds of perspectives, from the archival level, from an ethics standpoint, from a representational standpoint, from a data loss. Uh, my colleague, uh, Lenise, is interested in erasure. She's actually embedded in, she's a humanist who's embedded in a number of our projects. And so, so I would think of these um, collaboratives more in those terms. Um, you learn by proximity and you learn through, through diverse viewpoints and you learn by doing and so the most important thing to me is to try to jump in and engage and and create sort of an in, environmental conditions that allow you to experience those kinds of moments yeah and to add to that you know the goal of the data done that we did was to really understand explore the conceptual and methodology uh, methodological challenges um, that you know has an implication on on the data, and uh, what what uh, um, what what I did was I attended a lot of practical training. So my point is there were a lot of data cleaning, data analysis that we did, which was actually um, the data cleaning was the uh, um, um, the input to whatever artificial intelligence that you know um, we we may take in the future because those were the the future 
works that we would like to to work on but what what we benefited from from this um um data then is that we did series of presentations using general questions like you know uh, what are the approaches the methodologies in the decision making um in terms of you know the uh, the, the 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 archive data that we we worked on what were the art, art uh interesting findings that we found and what were the uh um, obstacles that we uh, um, encountered, and of course, we, we we were able to identify what would be the opportunities that we can look for. So, I mean, the the uh, data cleaning that we had um, are really essential, as Jan Lin said, um, could be the 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 output or the input for the next step of artificial intelligence. All right. So, for the sake of time. I want to say thank you to our participant. Thank you for joining us. And I just also want to say uh, thank you because this ends actually our series that I organized with uh, Dr. Ezri on uh, emerging technology, big data and archives. And then regarding your last question, actually, one of the first webinar that we had on um, as part of this uh, project was actually on artificial intelligence and archives. So I will advise if you can go you know, to the website and definitely find uh, the, the information that we have then actually also moving forward. The recordings are going to be available as well on this. So we want to thank uh, Claire for actually uh, sponsoring this, hosting us. We also want to thank a full grant from the Midland Foundation. We also want to thank uh, Oklahoma State University Emerging Technologies and Creativity Research Lab for co-hosting this webinar. We want to say a big thank you to the Schomburg Center for research in black culture, but also uh, New York University Library for actually allowing us, to, uh, giving us that space and that time to do this type of work. So with that being said, we want to say thank you. Please uh, thank you for our panelists and then a round of applause. And we hope you're going to have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the week. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you for the for putting this series together. It's really it's it's been really interesting. Thank you. Thank you for joining us.